Okay, this is Math 1090, Section 1.2 on Functions and Domain and Range. Let's get started with the definitions. A function is a relationship between two quantities where every input has exactly one output. A piecewise function is a function where the formula used depends upon the domain the input lies in. And the domain is the set of all inputs to a function. The range is the set of all outputs from a function. All right, let's look at this exercise. When sending a letter through the United States Postal Service, the price P depends on the weight W of the letter as shown in the table below. Here we identify that price is a function of weight. Okay, so we have this table and we are asked to determine what the domain of this function given by this table is. Now, typically when we're given a function as a table, the left-hand column will be the set of inputs or the domain. Um, but in this case, notice that the phrase weight not over occurs in the table. And of course, a letter could weigh somewhere between one and two ounces, like 1.6 ounces or something. So we, we also need to include the values in between those listed in the table. So really, you might be tempted to think that this would be a, the domain would be a discrete set just containing the numbers one, two, three, and 3.5. But I think a better way to describe the domain here would be via an interval. So the domain is okay so that's how I would describe the domain we would exclude 0 but include up to 3.5 what about the range well you're never gonna pay anything like halfway between 61 cents and 44 cents those are just the fixed prices as long as you don't go over the weight so this is a discrete set of values. All right, what would the cost, what would be the cost of a package that weighs 1.7 ounces? So in other words, what is the postage or price for a 1.7 ounce package? Well. 1.7 ounces, that's uh, over one ounce, but less than two ounces, so that would be 61 cents. And cost of a package that, or letter that weighs 2.2 ounces, uh, so that's more than two ounces, but less than three ounces, so that would be 78 cents. Okay, let's move on. Okay, there are several methods for representing values of a set. The table below compares the set described on a number line to inequality notation and interval notation. Okay, so we use the interval notation when we write sets uh, using the curly braces or the set builder notation. Um, so we need to understand both. And the key idea when looking at this table is there's two kinds of inequality. There's the strict inequality. Those are all represented by the blue marks on the left-hand column there and in the middle column. And then non-strict inequality. So it's things like less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. Those are um, denoted with the magenta symbols in the first and second columns there. Okay, let's look at an exercise here. Oh, one other thing is that when we combine intervals together, in other words, when we want to add intervals together, we use the union symbol or the, the, the U to combine two intervals. Okay, describe each set using interval notation. So we've got graphs of sets here on the number line. So the first set in example A goes from two on to positive infinity, including the endpoint two. So that would be 
part B, that goes from, let's see, negative infinity to two. And an important thing when doing uh, writing sets in interval notation is that the smaller number always has to go to the left. Okay, the smaller number always goes to, on the left. And negative infinity, although not a number, it's, it's definitely smaller than two. And then when writing infinity, we always use round parens or parentheses because it's not a number. Infinity is not a number, so we can't include it in the interval. Whereas here, um, the open circle means exclude two, so we use a round paren for that set as well, for that interval. Okay, C, well that's gonna be from, oops. The interval from one to five, we exclude one, we include five. Uh, part D, here we have two intervals that we want to union together. So this would be, There we go. All right, next exercise. Determine the domain and range of the graph below relating Alaska crude oil production over time. Okay, the domain corresponds with the horizontal axis and the range corresponds with the, the values on the Y or vertical axis. So our domain, it looks like is time in years going from 1975 to 2008. So and then our range it's a little harder. We'll have to estimate it. It looks to me like the lowest value on the y-axis corresponding to a point on the graph would be 180 and then the top point would be, uh, let's just say 2000. Okay. All right. Our next exercise, determine the domain and range of the graph below relating the world population over time. Okay, let's see here. Let's look at the graph. So we have the horizontal axis or the domain is time measured in years beginning with 1950 to 2005. But notice our, the points that are graphed actually begin, it looks like 19, ooh, 1952, and then the last data point on the graph, its x value looks to me to be 2003. So our domain here, I think, would be, no, the interval 1952 to 2003. Our range, let's see, the lowest y value would be 40. The greatest y value appears to be 88. And notice the y axis is measured in millions. Okay, it's perfectly fine to specify our range though using the same units as are used on the graph. Okay, so we don't have to write 40 million and 88 million, even though that's the units, it's perfectly fine to stick to the units in the graph. All right, next exercise. Find the domain of each of the following functions in both set builder and interval notation. All right, so remember what we need to do is restrict values uh, from our domain that cause either one of two things, um, division by zero or taking the an even root of a negative value. Okay, those are the two things we need to avoid. So in, in example A here, or exercise A, we immediately see that 
we need to avoid division by zero. If x is three, then we get division by zero. So x cannot equal three. So in set builder notation, we would say the domain is all x values such that x does not equal three. And in union, or sorry, interval notation, well, this would be all values except three. So that would be everything from negative infinity up to three, but excluding three. And then everything beyond three up to positive infinity. And so we would write that using a union of two intervals. So. There we go. Okay, exercise B. Here we have f of x is equal to the square root of x minus two. Okay, we need to avoid taking an even root. This is, even though the radix is not written, the radix is two, it's an even number. Uh, and we need to avoid taking the root of it, uh, or sorry, an even root of a negative number. So x minus two must be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, x minus two greater than or equal to zero, well, that's the same as x. If we add both, if we add two to both sides of that inequality, that's the same as saying x is greater than or equal to two. Okay, so in, in set builder notation, we would say the domain is the set of all x values such that x is greater than or equal to two. And then in interval notation, this would be the interval from two to positive infinity. All right, exercise C. Uh, here we have two problems. We need to avoid allowing the numerator, the, the x plus four expression being negative and we need to exclude x from equaling five. So we want to satisfy two requirements simultaneously. We wanna say um, x plus four has to be greater than or equal to zero and x minus five doesn't equal zero, which is the same as saying x cannot equal five. Uh, I can rewrite the first inequality as x. If I subtract four from both sides of that inequality, I get x is greater than or equal to negative four. All right. So in set builder notation, the domain would be uh, x such that x is greater than or equal to negative four and x does not equal to five. All right, and an interval notation, what would that be? That would be negative four up to five. We wanna exclude five though, and then from five on up to infinity. Okay, so um, part, <laughs> that should be D, not H. Okay, uh, our function is x plus five over x squared plus three x minus 28. Well, there's no problems in the numerator, um, but we do have some values that could make the denominator zero because the denominator polynomial factors to x, let's see, what does it factor to? I think four and seven are the correct numbers here. So x plus seven and x minus four. Let me fix that. All right, so we can't allow x to equal negative seven or positive four. Okay, so 
in set builder notation, we would say the domain is the set of all x's such that x does not equal negative 7 and x does not equal 4. Okay, and then in interval notation, well, we just want to avoid the points negative 7 and 4, but everything else is perfectly fine. So those two points break up the number line into three regions, which we can represent using intervals. So the first interval would be from negative infinity to negative 7. The next one would be from negative 7 to 4. And then finally, we would go from 4 to infinity. And we want to combine these intervals together, so we use the set union operation. OK. Find the domain and range of the following function in interval notation. OK, so the domain, it appears to me, goes from, let's see, 1 to 2, this region in here, or sorry, negative 1 to 2. We include negative 1, though, because the dot is filled in, but we exclude 2 from the domain. OK, so we want negative 1 to 2. There we go, an interval notation. Now, the same thing for the range. So these are the y values that correspond to points on the graph. On the graph and that would be, it appears everything from 0 to 4. So let's see. Uh, and we would exclude 0 but include 4. We exclude 0 because of the open circle drawn here, but the graph clearly goes up to 4 and hits 4, so we include 4. OK. So a piecewise function is a function where the formula, formula used for f of x depends upon the domain the input lies in. So this is the basic idea, what you, what is written here in this box. f of x is equal to formula 1 if uh, the x value uh, fits in the domain associated with that first formula. OK, so when evaluating a piecewise function, what you have to do, you have to check each of these domains and see which one your value fits into. It should only fit into one of those domains if the function is written correctly. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. It's not going to work. And then once you figure out which interval or range that the value fits into, you use the corresponding formula. So if I discovered that my x value fit into the range or the, the domain portion of the domain associated with this interval or interval, I would use formula 2 to evaluate the value of the function. Okay, so let's look at the exercise here. A cell phone company uses the function below to determine the cost C in dollars for G gigabytes of data transfer. OK, so this piecewise function divides the domain into two pieces, the piece from 0 to 2, and then the piece from 2 to positive infinity. All right, so question A here asks, what is the cost if a person uses 3 gigabytes of data transfer? In other words, what is C, the function C, evaluated at 3 gigabytes? OK, so 
What do we do? We first look at this right-hand column of our function and see, well, which value our g is, is bound to the value 3. So which interval does 3 satisfy? It satisfies the second interval or second inequality here. 3 is greater than or equal to 2. So that means we need to use this expression to evaluate our function and we just do 10 times g which is 3. So 10 times 3 so it's going to cost $30 if a person uses 3 gigabytes of data transfer. Part B. What is the cost if a person uses 1.5 gigabytes of data transfer? Okay well 1.5 if we bind g to the value 1.5 then again going to the definition of the function we see that 1.5 is between 0 and 2 so we use this expression to evaluate our function but it's a constant expression that's okay it doesn't involve g but it doesn't have to so it's a fixed cost if you use anywhere from 0 to 2 gigabytes you're going to get charged the same amount no matter how much, no matter what it was. Okay. Sketch part C. Sketch a graph of the piecewise defined cost function. Okay, so let's look at the definition again. Between 0 and 2, we have a, a fixed cost or a constant amount. Is the, the amount output from the function is constant at 20, $20. And then greater than 2, we have uh, this 10g. Okay. So let me get my ruler out here. Um, between 0 and 2, we're at $20. So there we go. And then what was it? Um, 10g if g is greater than or equal to 2. 10g. So what I need to do is draw the graph of the line. Ten g plus 0, right? So my y-intercept is 0. So I want to hit the, the origin there with my ruler. And then I want to make sure my ruler has a slope of 10. In other words, if I go one unit to the right, so as I go from 2 to 3, I better rise up 10 units. So I better rise up to 30. So that would be this point right, right here. Oops. Oh, it's drawing on the ruler, sorry. So let me just move the ruler a little bit. Let me just get it. I think I need to rotate it one more degree, maybe. There we go. Okay, so. All right, so I think maybe we should put a little arrow on that portion of the function to indicate it continues on forever. And, of course, we could put a little dot there if we want. All right, I think that's good. Okay, the Red Bull Energy Drink Company offers special pricing to vendors according to the scheme in the table below. Note that partial cases can be purchased at a prorated price. Okay, uh, part A. Write a piecewise function, c of x, for the price per case. And that is bolded and underlined there. So this is not total cost, is it? This is a, a function that gives us a price per case based upon the number of cases ordered. So let's see. Um, if x is in the interval... Hmm. Well, I could use interval notation here, but I think I will use the uh, inequality notation because that's more common when writing a piecewise function. 
So I could use interval, but I think it's just more common to use inequalities to represent your interval. So let's write, let's see, so less than four cases. So that would be, it, it could be equal to zero, but it has to be less than four. Okay, um, and in that case, it's a fixed cost per case. The charge per case is $18. And when writing functions, we always drop units here. We don't we don't attach the units uh, until the end of the problem. Okay, let's see. So the next interval comes from this second box in the table. Oops. Four more cases, but less than nine cases. So that would be between when x is between four, but less than nine. And then the lat and of course the charge per case then is 15. The final interval is nine or more cases. So when x is greater than or equal to nine, and the charge per case is ten dollars. Then okay, so graph the piecewise function c of x. So we've got these three values, 18, 15, and 10. They're just constant. Notice that they don't depend on x. They're just constant functions. That's OK. Get my ruler out again. OK, so for 18, that would go between 0 and 4. And then it's 15 between four and nine, so I think, oops, maybe to there, and then it drops down to $10 per case once you go beyond nine. And you know what I wanna do? I do wanna include little open circles here, here. Uh, actually, this goes on forever. And I want to include closed in circles here and here. All right. Let's see, 18, 15, 10. Did I get that right? The domain for the first one is 0 to 4. The d domain for the price of 15 is 4 to 9. Yeah. And ten dollars per case is when you order more than nine cases. Okay, here we go. Okay, finally, what is the cost to purchase nine cases of Red Bull? Well, let's see. The first four cases are going to cost us eighteen dollars per case. So the cost. Now remember, the, this, this function does not give us total cost. It gives us the cost per case. So we can't just um, use our previous piecewise function to determine total cost. We can only use it to determine the cost per case. So, um, so then the first four cases are going to cost us $18 each. So that would be 4 times 18 plus the next five cases, 4 plus 9 is 5, the next five cases are going to cost us $15 each. Let's see, 4 times 18, that's 40 plus 4 times 8, which is 32, so that's 72. 5 times 15 is 50 plus 25, that's 75, for a grand total of 147. So it will cost $147 to purchase nine cases of Red Bull. Okay, next. Complete the description of the piecewise function graphed below. Oops, okay. 
Well, let's see. First thing we want to do is figure out the regions of the domain. So there's three pieces. I see three different lines here. So our domain is broken up into three different pieces. It looks like the first piece goes from negative 4 to negative 1. So we would have uh, negative 4 for x values between negative 4 and negative 1 inclusive of the endpoints. The next interval goes from negative 1 to 3. We exclude negative 1 but we include 3. So And finally, the third interval goes from 3 to 6. We exclude 3, but include 6. OK, and these are constant functions on these intervals. So these functions won't involve x at all. Uh, let's see, the first interval has a y value. All the points on that interval have a y value of 1. So this is just 1 for that. All the y values in the second interval have are, are negative 3. And for the third interval, the y values are negative 4. There we go. Sketch the graph of the function f of x. All right, so we have the function is 0 if x is less than or equal to 1. So let me get my ruler out. Maybe I'll use blue to graph this. OK, so 0 if we're less than or equal to 1. And then um, 2 if x is greater than 4. So we come up to the y value of 2 if x is greater than 4. So that would be that portion. right? And that would continue in that direction. This continues off in that direction. And then this middle portion between 1 and 4. So for x values between 1 and 4, we have the line x minus 1, which is a line with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of negative 1. So let's graph that line. My line should hit negative 1 and should have a slope of 1. In other words, this should have a 45 degree uh, angle to it. There we go. Get my ruler in the right place there and just slide that just a bit more. It's a little finicky here. There we go. Okay. Now let's make sure we put the open circles and closed circles in the right place. So <clears throat> whenever you have these um, naked endpoints, you need to put a closed or open circle at them. So in this, uh, the middle portion of the function between 1 and 4, so that does include the four endpoints. So when x is 4, we use this uh, formula to evaluate the function, the x minus 1 formula. So we put a closed dot here. And since this does not include its endpoint of 4, we put an open circle. Uh, that's not really an open circle. Let's do that. That'll work. We'll put an open circle there. All right. There we go. That concludes our lesson for section 1.2.